others have seen that this this guy design in our hands works a lot better. And just so you don't think I'm, uh, uh, you know, only talking about our work. Uh, there, this is one example of another lab from Texas, I think, that showed the same thing. And I, there, at this point, there are four or five other papers that have shown that, that this our this modified guide design is generally better than what most people are using. So it's this. I'll get off my soapbox, but basically it's a bit surprising that people haven't switched toward this because there's no consequence as far as we can tell to having, well, unless you want an inducible system like Dana's using. But uh, in many cases, you want to maximize your guide expression and these changes <laughs> help with that. So uh, there are a variety of tools for silencing transcription or doing loss of function experiments, including you know RNAi and CRISPR, now CRISPR-I in human cells. And so we were excited about additional functions um, that we could specify using decal sign. So we uh, tested whether we could activate transcription as well. And you can imagine this would have a variety of applications for gain of function experiments um, uh, that could be useful in studying cancer biology or development. And so again, we took a page from the artificial transcription factor field and used the sort of who's who of domains to try to activate transcription of, of reporters. targeted a GFP reporter and asked to send this reporter to three binding sites for the SGRNA or expressly asked whether to turn GFP expression on. So if you look at the by later by full cytometry, we can see that um, specifically when we co-express the DCAS9 activator protein together with a guide targeting this promoter, we turn on GFP expression. So this is proof at least that we can uh, infuse these domains in DCAS9 and use them to target the genome and activate transcription of reporters. Disappointingly, when we uh, started to try to, to activate transcription of endogenous genes, we saw very clearly yeah. that this scheme doesn't really work very robustly to activate endogenous gene expression. And this is not entirely surprising. Yesterday, I showed you a slide from Keith Jung, Jung's lab where they were using tail VP64 fusions. And I didn't really walk you through the slide, but essentially what the paper activation of a gene, where if you have a single uh, binding site, you're only recruiting one copy of the CP64 domain, you don't get much activation. And so at that point, I think the, the field in general like started to engage with this, this idea that a, a, a simple artificial um, transcription factor that activates transcription with a single binding event was not going to be enough, um, or at least not enough with a single activation domain. And so we and others started to search for additional ways to recruit more activation domains with the expression of stabilized RNA. The way we solved this problem was we fused um, a highly optimized epitope tag to PCAS9. So uh, this is derived from the yeast GCN protein. It's a fairly linear epitope that can be connected by a short, flexible linker. We fused it to PCAS9. So now in theory, we, with one ed with expression, co-express a single chain fragment fused to this active, same activation domain, we can recruit up to 10 copies of the activation domain, sort of using a single sgRNA with a version 2 system to amplify our signal. So here, we're looking at it just a test of our gene. Gene's not really important, uh, although for the aficionados, this is a HIV co-receptor. Um, and you see with our version 1 system, when we target CXCR4, we really don't activate transcription at all. If you use our version 2 system, where we're now recruiting 10 copies of this activation domain, we see we turn on gene expression by about 40-fold. This gene is pretty much off in these cell types, so it's difficult to normalize the whole change. So you can get artificially large bold changes. So data. So these are six two cells that are unstained, so they just this is autoflora cells. They stain them for the uh. for expression and in some of it express a negative control guide RNA. You see, you know, they look the same as the, the unstained cells indicating
CXCR4 expressed on this cell type. If you then activate CXCR4 expression by expressing a guide in the presence of this version 2 crispr a system, we see that most of the cells in the population activate expression and that, the, you know, it's fairly homogenous across the population. And so this, the, w this, our ability to, there's a little bit of a subtle point, but our, it, sorry.
MS2 coat protein derived from a phage binds the MS2 stem loop with a very, very high affinity. So this is the KD listed here. And so this has been, um, this has been used in the past in synthetic biology to control recruitment of proteins using an RNA rather than using a protein. So we're talking about RNA-protein interactions, not protein-protein interactions. Um, and so one of the ways in which a second generation uh, CRISPR-A system for activating transcription was derived was to take advantage of the fact that we can append these MS2 stem loops onto an sgRNA. So now rather than uh, DCAS9 recruiting activator domains, the RNA is recruiting the activator domain by interacting with a second protein that's expressed. And so Fung appended uh, in his CRISPR-A system uh, VP64 domain directly to DCAS9, and then he also uh, appended two MS2 stem loops internally on the sgRNA um, in a, a manner that was um, informed by the crystal structure. So this was like really, really nice piece of work. They waited until they had the crystal structure and then didn't just blindly stick these MS2 stems onto, you know, the sgRNA sort of a uh, unguided fashion like we did, but instead said we're going to use the structure to figure out where we can append these and not impact the function of the sgRNA and uh, stuck to there, then showed that this doesn't compromise the activity of uh, sgRNA loading into mm. Cas9 or DCAS9. If you co-express uh, an MCP coat protein that binds to these uh, MS2 stem loops, fused to uh, P, uh, two activation domains called a P65 domain, this is derived from it the endogenous NF-kappa B pathway in human cells, along with the HSF1 activation domain, which is also an endogenous uh, activation domain, you're now with a single sgRNA recruiting three different activation domains. So this one's recruited with the protein, and these two are recruited by the RNA. Um, and he showed uh, in this paper that this works quite nicely to activate transcription of endogenous genes, and it we, is another way to um, multiplex your ability to deliver different domains using a, a DCAS9 and a single sgRNA. Um, we had a similar idea at UCSF. We didn't have the crystal structure at the time, so we just appended these stem loops to the C-terminus of an sgRNA. This is work from Jesse Zalatan, who has his own lab at Washington, University of Washington now, but the work was done in Wendell Lim's lab at UCSF. And what he was able to show is that, uh, as I have shown previously, we can use DCAS9 um, to control transcription, either just by using DCAS9 alone or by appending protein domains to DCAS9. And in this setting, the guide RNA that you express only encodes the locus that you're targeting. It doesn't do anything functionally. In contrast, if you start to append these RNA domains to an sgRNA, now the guide RNA encodes both the locus that you want to target and the action that you want to perform. So you can express, you can append different S, uh, different um, hairpin structures to an sgRNA uh, that are targeted to different genomic locations, and with one DCAS9, will activate and repress transcription at different loci. Uh, so that's shown here, where you have this purple uh, fused to this green effector domain. Controlled by this great DCAS9, and so this can all be targeted to gene X. And then in the same cell with the same DCAS9, you don't need an orthogonal DCAS9, you can append a different sgRNA with a different stem loop that recruits a different protein that's used to a different effector domain to do something different at a different locus. So it just increases your ability to use one CRISPR system to control the expression of multiple genes in different ways, in a way that you can imagine could be really uh, useful for a lot of applications. And so the question was, does this work? Um, uh, Jesse fused uh, three different uh, stem loops to the sgRNA and showed that each of these, when you co-express a protein uh, that recognizes a stem loop fused to an effector domain, can activate transcription of a reporter gene in yeast. Um, so the, they're quantitatively a bit distinct, but you can see that if you co-express all these components together, each of these will activate expression of this uh, Venus reporter. Um, this uh, can be used to, he showed that there was no crosstalk between binding pairs, so these are, you can co-express these in the same cell and they, they don't encode the wrong functions at the wrong loci, so uh, there's, they're, they're, another way of saying that is they're completely orthogonal. Um, you can use uh, this same sgRNA scaffold general structure to recruit, um, to amplify your 
signal, so you can append multiple stem loops to one sgRNA to either recruit one, two, or three of these effector uh, proteins, um, and that that can have an additive effect on transcription. And then you can also append two different RNA stem loops to the same sgRNA. So here we're appending an MS2 stem loop and a PP7 to the same sgRNA, and with in, in this manner you can recruit uh, either two of the same domain using an RNA or two different domains using one RNA. Um, to control transcription. Um, this also works in human cells, so we use the uh, MS2 system or this uh, com crab system uh, to show that in, this, in human cells with one DCAS9, we can control expression of two genes and turn one off and turn the other on. So, uh, that's shown here, where here we're activating expression of CXCR4 or we're turning off expression of B4 gallon T1 or we can turn on one gene and turn off the other gene at the same time um, using one DCAS9. So it just increases your flexibility for to control and transcription across the genome. Um, this uh, works for metabolic control, which you could imagine like the ability to control multiple genes dynamically is, could be really useful for uh, metabolic imaging. And so in yeast, um, Jesse was able to show that uh, he could tune the output of this violation pathway. This is a fairly complex pathway that has 